Hello everybody, my name is Maddie, aka Don't Even Dream About It, aka Miss Marksy, and I'm here today with Cody Without Organs. We are both bloggers, Deluza guitarians, Marxist, anarchist, and theory nerds. Together, we create an assemblage which goes under the proper name of Negative Maps. Right now, our shared projects are on Substack, and we are planning to release our book, Negative Maps, sometime in the near future. Is there anything you'd like to add, Cody? Uh, just that I'm mega excited to be working with Waters Press. They've already got their Volume 1 Futures out, and their Volume 2 Systems is coming out soon. So please check them out if you're here listening and excited for future releases. Uh, I'm happy for you to continue, Matty. Wonderful. Thank you, Cody. Um, today, we are going to be discussing the philosophy of 17th century philosopher Baroque de Spinoza, as read by the 20th century philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Our ultimate goal for today is to tackle the Deleuzean Spinozan question of what can a body do? And in order to do that, we are going to start by going over Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza and then end with a discussion of Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the body without organs. Well, we hope that by the end of this discussion, the terms body without organs and plane of eminence should become familiar. We want to display the way in which Deleuze incorporates Spinoza into his own metaphysical system, the language that he and Guattari develop and take further in their A Thousand Plateaus, and how one can navigate the Deleuzean text on Spinoza practical philosophy. We will be trying to answer the question, what can a body do, as Matty has perfectly put it, who I am now incredibly honoured to be joined with for these discussions and classes. How do we define a body in the Spinozan ethics? from asking specifically what a body is to asking what a body can do. This is one of the many metaphysical notions Deleuze gathers from Spinoza. It is a perspective shift from questions of an ontological nature to do with being to an ethology to do with the relations between beings. Whilst Deleuze refers to himself as a pure metaphysician, and with his accomplice, the Lacanian student of psychoanalysis, Felix Guattari, often we see instead of an esoteric language that you often get when discussing philosophy, especially of the continental variety, the loser Guattari will take concepts and terms out of science, literature, and several other domains. Ontology to ethology will be one of our major examples here, as is throughout the text of practical philosophy. Deleuze and Guattari tell us that their usage of terms to do with black holes, bodies without organs, strata and sedimentation has nothing to do with metaphors. What they are doing is using terms in their literal sense, in a domain to which they do not formally belong. This is part of the overall project DNG aim at and encourage us to engage with in their schizoanalysis and nomadology to find tools and weapons, perhaps in the forms of concepts and ideas, such as from scientific schools and disciplines like astronomy, geology, and biology, to mention the rhizome here, for example, and in literature, such as that of the playwright Antonin Artaud, who gives us the language of the body without organs to which Deleuze and Guattari are so often citing. We will see this a lot in both Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateau, and hopefully we will dip into that within this talk today. This is a part of the package in Andalusian metaphysics, which also belongs to what is called process philosophy. It is found in a few of the philosophers Deleuze draws inspiration from, including, of course, Spinoza, but also a list of thinkers such as Friedrich Nietzsche, Heraclitus, Alfred North Whitehead, who we have started to cover in these discussions and others we hope to perhaps cover next. Process philosophy hinges on movement, flux, low and becoming, a word with a lot of importance for Deleuze and Guattari. It is what they wish to talk about. Whereas many philosophers leading up to the 21st century in the continental traditions of France and Germany are talking about being and its nature, what we call ontos, not unlike the philosophies of the ontological and the existential, for instance the phenomenologies of Heidegger and Sartre in their being in time and being in nothingness, which respond in their own ways to the dialectical philosophy of Hegel on being and non-being. Deleuze refers to this as state or molar philosophy, as opposed to minor philosophy. 
the discussions on becoming process and difference is exactly uh, what Deleuze and Guattari wish for us to explore in their nomadology as a philosophy which resists the philosophy of the state. Deleuze has takes us back. Oh, sorry, did that again. <laughs> Deleuze has taken us back to Spinoza to find a new lens in which to ask the same questions in a different way. What is a body? Not to ask about the being of a body, but of the becoming of bodies. What can a body do, especially in relation to other bodies, an ethology? And not to focus on the negativity in relations between bodies, as we had discovered in Deleuze's Nietzsche and philosophy. The negative takes a back seat to affirmation, or what Deleuze calls empiricism and pluralism, which he amounts to the same thing. And instead we are invited to explore forces and relations in terms of their abilities to affect and be affected. Not to explore the definitions of bodies by their functions or organs, but by their movements and relations. Questions of bodies are always questions of events, encounters, and what we call hexaities. It is Spinoza who tells us that we have yet to find out what a body can do. And attempting to answer the famous online question of what the hell is a body without organs, as well as the far, left, the far less often asked question of what does the plane of imminence have to do with it, and also perhaps as well, why Spinoza? especially following a philosopher out of Deleuze's metaphysics like Nietzsche. Well, Deleuze's Spinoza in Practical Philosophy opens with a line on Nietzsche, which is not a rare move for Deleuze to read one of his texts on a specific philosopher and to see several other names come up just as often. In Practical Philosophy, it is very clear that just as important as the name Spinoza is for Deleuze, we find that Nietzsche is too. In his larger text on Spinoza expressionism, we find that this is the case more so with the philosopher Leibniz, who perhaps we may cover next under the roster of Deleuze's key thinkers. Born in Amsterdam in 1632, Spinoza was a philosopher, theologist, and lens maker of Portuguese Jewish descent, who is best known for his theory of affects, his reprioritization of the philosophy of body, or parallelism, as well as his pantheism, or panentheism, which is described as substance monism. To Deleuze, quote, Spinoza belongs to that of the private thinkers who overturn values and construct their philosophy with hammer blows. He is not a public professor, end quote. As such, Deleuze admires Spinoza for a similar reason he admires Nietzsche, quote, Spinoza projects an image of the positive, affirmative life, which stands in opposition to the semblances that men are content with. Deleuze does not view Spinoza as some have as a philosopher espousing liberal attitudes, despite him often being read that way. That isn't to say that Spinoza does not hold any liberal sympathies. Deleuze says, no doubt Spinoza also frequented liberal and anti-clerical Christians, Colligans, and Mennonites, were also inspired by the similar pantheism and pacifist communist attitudes. Which is to say, Spinoza may have held some liberal leanings, but broke with them primarily with his views against monopoly, his denunciation of wealth, and his pacifist tendencies, which Deleuze talks about in the text, mentioning how Spinoza was fascinated with natural death watching insects and creatures fighting to the death, for instance, Spinoza, the original Pokemon master. Deleuze asks, how does the slow philosophical conversion come about that causes him to break with the Jewish community with businesses and bring to his excommunication of 1656? In response, Deleuze says that it would be a mistake to think of the viewpoints of people at the time as being the same. There are in fact a diversity of theological viewpoints in Spinoza's time, that of Catholicism, Judaism, as well as the Muranos, who are a Jewish people who outwardly practiced Catholicism. Despite the diversity of thought at the time, Spinoza's work provoked a violent response from Jewish readers, Calvinists, Catholics, and even Cartesians 
According to Deleuze, it became so bad that the words Spinozism and Spinozist became insults and threats. What makes Spinoza such a radical thinker for his time, which led to his excommunication at the young age of 23 years old, before he was even published or published his first religious text, were his religious views. According to the scholar of Spinoza, Stephen Nadler, neither the harem itself nor any document about the period tells us exactly what his evil opinions were, supposed to have been, nor the abominable heresies or monstrous deeds he is allegedly to have practiced and taught. Deleuze tells us, apparently, that an attempt on Spinoza's life was made after the publication of his first controversial text, and that Spinoza had kept in his jacket a hole with a knife in it, a reminder that not everyone takes so kindly to ideas. Spinoza would live a life of fear and removal from society because of the radicalism of his works. However, it is likely that Spinoza was excommunicated due to his unorthodox views on God, which also tie into his skepticism of authority and tyranny. Quoting Nadler, quote, Among the boldest elements of Spinoza's philosophy is his conception of God. Spinoza's God, as presented in the Ethics, is a far cry from the traditional God of the Abrahamic religions. What Spinoza calls God or nature, or Deus Siv Natura lacks all of the psychological and ethical attributes of a provincial deity. His god is not some personal agent endowed with will and understanding and even emotions, capable of having preferences and making informed choices. Spinoza's god does not formulate plans, issue commands, have expectations, or make judgments. Neither does Spinoza's God possess anything like a moral character. His God is neither good nor wise nor just. It is just a category mistake to think of God in normative and value terms." End quote from Nadler. Rather than God being some guy in the sky who dictates commandments and tyrannical decrees or a transcendent God, God is seen here as the infinite substance that is nature or an immanent God. Everything then becomes an expression of God or nature's infinite attributes. More importantly, since God is no longer viewed as an authority figure who issues supreme law, the moralism brought by state religion is thrown into question. The supreme law of being is replaced with a natural law of ethics. Morality is replaced with an ethics. Spinoza's theology allows us to think of an entirely new way to describe phenomena and their interactions. It is indeed strange that in asking questions concerning the empirical, we do so only by relating it to the conversation on the nature of God, what we call theological and metaphysical discussions. This is the gold of the ethics which Deleuze takes most of his inspiration of Spinoza from in this text. Substance monism and Deus Sive Nature provide a philosophy with key, three key paths. Each of these three were part of the radical and extreme controversy behind Spinoza's works, which warranted his excommunication and harem and succinct attempts on his life. Deleuze starts off, as we already warned in the introduction, not by naming Spinoza, but instead by naming Nietzsche. To quote, Nietzsche understood, having lived it himself, what constitutes the mystery of a philosopher's life. The philosopher appropriates the ascetic virtues, humility, poverty, chastity, and makes them serve ends completely his own. Extraordinary ends that are not very ascetic at all, in fact. Deleuze doesn't write on an author by themselves. He seeks to explore connections connections which serve a purpose, or multiple, to aid and benefit the work of the author or of Deleuze himself. That is to say, we are reading Deleuze's Spinoza, as well as through the lens of Nietzsche, and Nietzsche through the lens of Spinoza. 
with the first chapter serving as a bit of a bio to Spinoza's life, mentioning points which configure a mixture of an almost mythological Spinoza, who gets stabbed and continues to wear his torn cloak as a reminder that ideas are not welcomed by the folks and the peoples, and to a radical philosophical Spinoza, one that Deleuze tells us does not necessarily appear within his works, but within the outskirts of his works. Spinoza's more radical self was one hidden for obvious reasons from the state and church. Deleuze's Spinoza, then, is the one who did not get to fully flesh out the radicalism of his own thought, which Deleuze believes must be extracted from his pages, from his life, and from his letters. It is this aspect in which Deleuze draws connections between the two philosophers, Nietzsche and Spinoza. This same vibe carries across into the opening of his Difference and Repetition, where he refers to a philosophically bearded Hegel and a philosophically clean-shaven Marx. It is in the opening of the second chapter of Practical Philosophy where we see the Deleuzean ties or points of connectivity in the rise of, of Spinoza and Nietzsche. To quote, We must start rather from the practical theses that made Spinozism an object of scandal. These theses imply a triple denunciation of consciousness, of values, and of sad passions. These are the three major resemblances with Nietzsche, and already in Spinoza's lifetime, they are the reasons for his being accused of materialism, immoralism, and atheism." End quote. This is then what is explored, both apologizing and defending Spinoza for these points, and clarifying the points for what they truly should be. Spinoza the transcendental empiricist, Spinoza the ethicist, and Spinoza the pan and theist. It is not to say that these three claims made of Spinoza by his enemies are wrong. In fact, they are our points of departure for Deleuze into finding Spinoza's contribution to a minor practical philosophy. One way to understand Spinoza, or at least Deleuze's Spinoza, is to understand Spinoza's radical conception of a body. For Deleuze, Spinoza is different from philosophers of his day because Spinoza does not subordinate the mind to the body, nor the body to the mind. This is what Deleuze calls Spinoza's parallelism. Parallelism basically means that, rather than the body, controlling the mind or the mind controlling the body, they both work together in a parallel fashion. Even more radically, Spinoza doesn't ever claim to arrive at a transcendental field of forms where they can truly understand what a body even is, let alone what it can do. An often cited passage from Deleuze's book quotes Spinoza as saying, we don't even know what a body can do. This is very important to understand because here, we stop seeing a body as attempting to fit into some perfect or ideal form and start to see a body as well as bodies as a site for experimentation. Earlier we hinted at a key of Spinoza's philosophy, that Spinoza replaces the supreme law of morality with the topology of ethics, the transition from ontology being forms and essences, to ethology, modes, affects, attributes, and relations. Whereas the supreme law of morality would fit nicely with the Platonic tradition, to view bodies' essences as seeking to reach its own internal perfection, viewing ethics as a topology or as a sort of mapping allows us to view ethical decisions in terms of bodily relations. On the one hand, we have relations of composition which produce joy and increase the body's power, and on the other hand, we have relations of decomposition which harm a body and produce sadness. Consider the differences between food and poison. When the bodies of a person consume the bodies of food, we might either produce joy by making them full, or produce sadness if the food gives them a stomach ache. Conversely, when a person consumes poison, such as spoiled food, they will become sick. With other types of poison, such as a snake bite, snake venom, for example, they might die. Although this may seem simple on the purpose, Deleuze reminds us that when we start to view ethics as a topology, or as a kind of experimentation, ethics belongs... 
ethics becomes only more complicated, not less, because moral decisions are no longer ordained by God. Ethics become situational, relational, and experimentational. We are not merely talking about the human body anymore, nor are we placing life in containers such as animal, plant, or human. According to Deleuze, every reader of Spinoza knows that for him, bodies and minds are not substances or subjects, but modes or modifications. It is not enough, however, to merely think of this theoretically, end quote, for what he says. Modes are modifications or expressions of a singular substance which could either be named God or nature, or Deus ev natura. The order of expression goes from substances, which are expressed as attributes, thought and extension, which are further expressed or individuated into modes, belief, desire, shape, and size, for example. Rather, we are now using the word body more broadly and more specifically at the same time. A body is now seen as a set of relations of speed and slowness and a set of affects that occupy a body at each moment, or in other words, latitude and longitude, or vertical and horizontal on a map. Intensive states on a map which don't necessarily end at the limits of human, animal, plant, or machine body either. In the final chapters of Practical Philosophy, Deleuze gives his definition of the body. 1. Latitude. A body is composed by an infinite assortment of particles whose relation to each other is defined by movement and rest at varying speeds. And 2. Longitude. Bodies have the capacity to affect and to be affected by other bodies, often by increasing or decreasing the power of the other, but more often entering into more complex relationships of joy and sadness. Again, this is why Spinoza argues for an ethics rather than a morality. The values of from morality are already made, and more problematically set up arbitrary relations of good and evil with out having to justify these moral claims to a relation to the outside, an ethics is an imminent topology, which is to say it requires materialist transvaluation of values. Good and evil are therefore replaced with a set of good and bad relations between bodies, which are understood as a kind of affects the relations produce. Since we no longer know what a body can do, we arrive at a materialist ethics by finding out what bodies can do, how they interact, and what kind of passions their interactions give way to. Ethics, ethics is a topology and an ethology, a mapping of bodies in relation to others. Where is ethics mapped? The answer Deleuze gives us through Spinoza is the plane of eminence, or what Fisher calls the Gothic flatline. The plane of eminence which is set up in opposition to a plan of organization, is a process of composition that must be apprehended for itself through that which it gives, in that which it gives. Which is to say, if a body is composed of latitudes and longitudes, the plane of eminence is like the Gothic flatline, where everything happens where intensities and affects are mapped. Deleuze cites musicians, poets, and artists as well as operating on the plane of eminence, not concerned with form, but with how a body is composed, what affects are produced, and how their bodies operate. All music styles follow a set of rules and common practices which define it as such, or they all have a plan of organization. but. What makes music an imminent force is how it's composed as a variation of speeds and rests. Jazz music, for example, is composed of elements which define it as such, but how jazz music is experienced phenomenologically is its speed and movement. There is a clear difference between the somber slowness of Coltrane and Ellington's in a sentimental mood and Sons of Kemet's forcefully brutal inner Babylon 
or even the speedy footwork of Ellington's blow-by-blow. -blow. The difference being their speed, relations between bodies of sounds, and the affects they produce. As Deleuze says, quote, there is no longer a form, but only relations of velocity between infinitesimal particles of an unformed material. There is no longer a subject, but only individuating effective states of an anonymous force. In a fuzzle plateau, the loser Guattari write, in their plateau becoming animal under the sections of Hexaidi and the bodies of Spinoza's in 1 and 2, they draw out some of their concepts that explore this idea of cartography, using the terms like longitude and latitude, which refer to the x and y axes of a 2D map or a 3D model, that make up the geographic coordinate system of a sphere, like the Earth, for measuring and communicating positions directly on the surface. Deleuze says it is the simplest, oldest, and most widely used of the various of spatial reference systems. To explore Spinoza's body, as well as some ideas of the body of our organs, such as the hexaity and modes of individuation. To quote a thousand plateau, a body is not defined by the form that determines it, nor as the determinate substance or subject, nor by the organs it possesses or the functions it fulfills. On the plane of consistency, a body is defined only by a longitude and a latitude. In other words, the sum total of the material elements belonging to it, under given relations of movement and rest, speed and slowness, longitude, and the sum total of the intensive effects it is capable of at a given power or degree of potential latitude." End quote. There are a few different metaphor systems within the beginning of this plateau. Cartographic, chemical, physical, meteorological, and even theoontological. But these are not metaphors or metonyms, they are concepts stolen from their home and taken somewhere else. They become nomadic and find a new piece of land. We steal the terms from other existing systems to forge our own, to make ours better. The body of our organs is like this too. It is stolen from a work by Antone and Artaud to have done with the judgment of God, a 1947 play. Artaud and Spinoza are totally why Deleuze and Guattari are 100% okay with drugs. The leap from morality to ethics is from transcendent values to an imminent apology, as we've been saying. For instance, you might say drugs are bad, as in drugs are bad in themselves, and this really means that drugs are evil, which is a moral claim. But to say instead drugs are too bad when you do too many means that drugs in essence or by themselves are not inherently bad or evil, but become bad through their usage. It is their effects which are bad, their relations to other relations, and this is ethics. There is an episode of the show Midnight Gospel in which a karmic prison that demonstrates the idea of this as a part of a non-dualistic philosophy, or what we see in what we call Hinduism and Buddhism, that we are not consciousness in a particular being or self, but we are consciousness itself being expressed. Oh man, who cares? We are not our body, nor our relation to our body, but we are the relations to relations. We are different, and always becoming, never static, never stopping or starting, and always on the move. And this is also the fundamental logic of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan's objet A, or the objet petit A, which is a driving force of production and desire, whilst itself representing a lack. It is a non-object, and that is why it is called the object cause of desire, and not the object of desire. Objet A is not the thing we desire, it is why we desire. Which is also a question of who, since to quote, desire is the desire of the other. D and G describe their bodies without organs in terms of both other, subject, desiring, and non-desiring. Drugs are only bad insofar that some drugs decompose your body's relations and produce sadness. For example, heroin, which is often described as a sensational feeling in the short term, ultimately does more to decompose your body and its relation to the outside, 
Weed or even psychedelics may also have some degree of decomposition or deterritorialization, but they also bring with it new kinds of composition. Some common sentiments expressed by those who have done psychedelics are, I have seen God, I taste colors, my mind is open and I feel at one with the universe. These are imminent experiences accompanied with the loss of self or an ego death where they experience the idea of a Spinoza's God. One might think of the Freudian patient Judge Schrieber, whose sun rays, which emanated from God and beams into his ass in an attempt to make him into a woman. Freud saw this as the purely decompositional breakdown of Schrieber's reality, or psychosis as decompositional, and he also saw this as in the name of Schrieber's father. The main critique that D and G have, if any, of psychoanalysis is the anti-Oedipal one. Freud does nothing but overcode desire, productions, relations into the Oedipal model, into an Oedipal coding. Everything goes back to dad, whether it's about God, or whether it's about sex, or whether it's about just going for a simple stroll to the park. Perhaps Deleuze and Guattari invite us to truly listen to Judge Schrieber to map out what is being said and done, rather than interpreting and trying to find a singular representation, what we call an overcoding, to prescribe a godly judgment. We would perhaps today find a trans and religious Judge Schrieber, a Spinozan queer Schrieber, whose psychosis is compositional. This is the underlying premise of anti oedipus Desire is productive. The unconscious is productive, a factory. Psychoanalysis has drawn out the unconscious and immediately limited it to Oedipus, to a theater. Schizoanalysis, as opposed to psychoanalysis, recognizes the unconscious as inherently schizophrenic, constantly shifting and breaking down codes materially. This is also a return to Marx through Hegel and Spinoza. Many think of D&G as going further from Hegel through Marx and Spinoza, when really D&G are nomads who belong to no one, who explore the connections and differences between thoughts and thinking. Marx determines to turn Hegel on his head by declaring it is not consciousness which determines social reality, but social reality which determines consciousness in the preface to the critique of political economy. D&G say that both consciousness, desiring production, and the socius, which we call anti-production, are machines that produce and consume, that affect one another, on the surface of the body with our organs. Desiring machines like us meet other desiring machines, either destroying or affirming. And this is why Foucault says in the preface to the English edition of Anti-Oedipus that it is an ethical text despite that it does not prescribe ethical judgments. It is one which unites and connects forces to reduce joyful passions. Marxism, Hegelianism, Spinozism, Nietzscheanism, materialism, and psychoanalysis. The topology of immanence, or the plane of immanence, is to explore not only what is, but to the relations between what is and between the relations of these relations, what we call affects. It is on this basis that one is always becoming, always multiple, but one is never too sure what one is becoming, good, bad, it depends. It doesn't depend on what is, and this is why moral morality is an ontology concerned with being. Instead, it depends on the relations between what is and between the relations of what isn't, and once again, between the relations of these relations. What is considered good or bad, joyful or sad passions, has to do with the relations between bodies, and not to do with the makeup of the bodies themselves. This is why it is called a body without organs. So you may be asking yourself, what the hell even is a body without organs? Explain it to me right now, right fucking now. Defining a body without organs is not a simple task, for as we have explained, it requires us to radically reconfigure how we conceptualize what a body even is. One way to simply break down the concept before making it complicated again is that the body without organs is a body without organization. In the plateau, how to make yourself a body without organs, 
to lose a guitar, he explained that the body without organs is opposed not to the organs, but to that organization of the organs called the organism. Which is to say, the body without organs is what unifies in an asymmetric manner a multiplicity of bodies in a chaotic, anarchic state of intensity. The whole of this plateau tells a story of multiple processes, that of composition, stratification, and unification on the one hand, decomposition, destratification, and disorganization on the other. Deleuze and Guattari say that we will be organized, signified, and subjectified, as well as disarticulated and hooked into the rhizome. The body without organs is the zone where the sum total of these compositions and decompositions take place, where everything is constantly becoming something else. Why not walk on your head, sing with your sinuses, see through your skin, breathe with your belly, the losing guitar you ask. They go on to say that whereas psychoanalysis focuses too much on finding ourselves, we should instead find our bodies without organs, forget our past lives, and experiment with the potentials of our bodies without organs. They say, find your bodies without organs. Find out how to make it. It's a question of life and death, youth and old age, sadness and joy. It is where everything is played out. To find your bodies without organs, therefore, is to experiment on many milus and stratum. Relations are not organs, and they are not bodies either, but the relations between bodies and other bodies, between bodies and their organs, and between organs and other organs. A body without organs can still be good or bad, joyful and sad. Joyful and sad are determined by the relationship. So it, is, it is always between one thing and another. This is why there is always an exterior, or an outside, and there is always an interior. And there is also always a folding, where these exteriors and interiors meet. A folding is the limit of the interior and exterior. If a relationship is compositional, that is, it affirms and joins both bodies and their relations, affects to become greater, to join and form a larger whole or unity which combines the powers of both bodies and their abilities to affect, it is what we call joyful. On the contrary, when bodies collide and destroy one another and their abilities to affect both each other and the world, reducing one another's power and not becoming a greater whole but dividing and transubstantiating one another, making lesser, this is sad, a sad passion. We can see here a deeply structuralist Spinoza. When Christ was left by God on the cross, and Christ forsook his own father, this was a reaction, and a sad one. His ability to affect and to be a part of a greater whole was removed. Christ was decomposed. So what determines whether or not a thing is composed or decomposed? A thing is only composed or decomposed insofar as it, its image is. That is to say, its essence, its being, is what is being affected. But here we go. What a thing is, is constantly changing, constantly becoming. Collisions contain elements of composition and decomposition. Whether or not a body or relationship is composed and compositional is determined insofar as it appears to be the case. This doesn't mean that it is the case, because the case is always itself unfolding and changing. For example, in my essay Buffy the Vampire Slayer vs. the Body Without Organs, I argue that when Willow transforms into Dark Willow, this happens because she allows herself to encounter and subsume a multiplicity of dark magical forces which simultaneously compose her into a powerful and nearly unstoppable assemblage while at the same time decomposes her body in relation to others. Dark Willow becomes estranged from her friends and becomes, quote, addicted to magic. Dark Willow is not evil per se, but more so operates as a delusio Guattarian sorcerer, or a Spinozist who experiments with the potentials of magics to see what magic can do. Dark Willow is a dark delusion who recognizes that, quote, 
a becoming animal always involves a pack, a band, a population, a peopling, in short, a multiplicity. However, despite the fact that some bodies without organs may produce something powerful, this does not mean that all bodies without organs are the same. Some are full, others are empty, and others are cancerous. One may think of the jewel of the fates. The two bodies without organs of Anakin Skywalker, one his turning to the dark side and Sith, and the other his loss of limbs and skin, to be replaced with a mechanical machine body, his becoming Vader. These two bodies without organs collide and crash into one another. They fill and empty and become cancerous. These consist of how our bodies are formed, how they affect and are affected by one another. Losing limbs, replacing limbs, turning to the dark side. All of these things take place on their own and in their plane of imminence, within their own planes of consistency and organization. We can view planes of consistency by the dualisms they form, dark, light, limbs attached or detached, and the plane of imminence as this flat line. It is where these dualisms break down internally and form a flat line, where dark and light are both on the same plane, where their internality, sorry, where their internal limits break down, and where dualisms come into contact with other dualisms, forming new flat lines. Anakin's becomings are on several bodies without organs, in his physical flesh, in his activity, in the terrain and organizations which surround him. Going back to Matty's last point, what are the types of bodies without organs? Full, some others are empty, and some others are cancerous. In the plateau, how to make yourself a body without organs, Deleuze and Guattari distinguish between three types of bodies without organs, as we've just stated, full, empty, and cancerous. The free body problem, they call it. A full body without organs contains elements of composition and decomposition, but it is careful in how it does so. It operates by movements of relative deterritorialization and re-territorializations. Deterritorialization is once again decomposition. It is the breakdown of a body. It is the outside breaking in, the destruction of limits. Reterritorializations then are compositions and stratifications. They are the finding of new limits, new organizations. This isn't to say that compositions are purely good and decompositions are purely bad, but that the effects brought about by compositions and decompositions can be qualified as such. It is good, for instance, to decompose the state for an anarchist and to compose a self-governing workers' democracy for the Marxist. It is good to decompose a poison so as to compose life. Only in so far as we can intelligently and intuitively deduce that more compositional effects or relations have emerged and more decompositions which have been done carefully so as to maintain one another, what we call reckless composition and vitalism, invites in cancer and vampires. Life itself becomes sucked and absorbed into growth for the sake of growth, like the Star Trek Borg who go around assimilating and composing itself into other organisms. Fascism is this cancerous composition, which composes itself only to absorb everything else into it, bringing everything down with it. Reckless decomposition leads to entropy and death. On the one hand, Deleuze and Guattari remind us that, quote, dismantling the organism has never meant killing yourself, but rather opening the body to connections that presuppose an entire assemblage, circuits, conjunctions, levels, and thresholds, passages and distributions of intensity in territories and deterritorializations measured with the crafts of a surveyor. Or in other words, <laughs> opening our bodies to others in such a way that we are placed into a broader context, a Spinozan program as Fisher would call it, can lead to a proliferation of a positive difference, a joyful revolution which liberates rather than constraining our desire or redirecting it to an aborescent form of power. On the other hand, as Cody mentioned, if we de-stratify too quickly or decompose too quickly, we become empty and we lose our potential. How to Make Yourself a Body Without Organs is an anti-fascist text par excellence. 
Deleuze and Guattari call fascism a cancerous body without organs because latent within fascism is an internal death drive or a suicidal nihilism not to only destroy oneself or to make oneself empty, but to also destroy everything in its path, like a cancer. It's a force that grows or populates within social bodies. The result of a cancerous body without organs is a transformation into an empty body without organs. When the body has taken too much cancer, it dies. Cancerous and empty body without organs are both reckless, however, one is compositional and the other is decompositional. Reckless composition is the cancerous. It is pain or masochism and addiction for the sake of itself ad nihilo ad infinitum. Reckless decomposition is the empty body without organs. It goes nowhere, zero intensity. Ethics and a thousand plateau is a cartography of being careful. It maps out for us how to use our awareness of things and our intuition and desire to always remain careful about how one does things and goes about doing things. Ethics is the joy of being careful, of not being reckless. Even a kind of recklessness can be careful, since as we've said, it's not things in themselves which concern the ethics, but it is what they can do. We do not care so much what a thing is, only what it does or how it works. Careful desire, then. This is what materialist psychiatry, schizoanalysis, and the ethics of the losing Guattari aims at. How to be careful when it comes to desire. 